All right, next video lecture here will be, we're going to start talking about neurotransmitters. Let me get my full screen view up there. All right, so uh, when we went through, um, I should say Unit 5 Physiology, not Chapter 5 Physiology. I just noticed they're on the slide. Um, so when we were in Unit 4, we were learning about the muscular system. We uh, learned about one uh, neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is secreted by motor neurons that control your skeletal muscles. But that is not the only type of chemical signal that is uh, that can be secreted by neurons. Different neurons, different parts of the ner nervous system um, secrete different types of neurotransmitter. The overall purpose is the same. That is the chemical communicating molecule that's passed from one neuron to another neuron. But as we'll, as we'll see, these different types of neurotransmitters can have different functions. All right, so this lecture will be uh, about some of the classification of neurotransmitters. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is that most of your neurons, the billions and billions of neurons that we have in our nervous system, actually make two or more neurotransmitters, so they're not just limited to one. That doesn't mean that they secrete both of them at the same time. Um, different stimulation frequencies, so how frequently action potentials are coming down the axon, because remember it's the action potential traveling down the axon and reaching those axon terminals, that's what actually triggers neurotransmitters to be uh, secreted. So um, different frequencies of stimulation, kind of like we talked about with muscle contraction, when you have more frequent stimulations from uh, the motor neuron, the skeletal muscle fiber will contract more strongly. Um, same thing with your uh, neurons that secrete more than one type of neurotransmitter. More frequent stimulation can lead them to secrete more than one neurotransmitter. We may not even know the identities of all the neurotransmitters yet in the human body. There are 50 or more that have been um, identified. They can be classified by their chemical structures and their um, functions. All right, so one, we'll talk about some of the chemical classification first, just kind of as an overview. Um, acetylcholine is more or less often a class by itself. And um, now that's the one that we learned about when we covered the muscular system. Motor neurons secrete this as a signal over to your muscle fibers. But then uh, we'll have a lecture a little bit later about the autonomic nervous system in a little bit more detail. And what we're going to see is that acetylcholine is also produced by your um, autonomic nervous system neurons, but it has different functions. Um, and so we're used to thinking about acetylcholine as something that stimulates uh, skeletal muscle fibers to contract, but in the autonomic system it can have very different functions. So that's an example of the same chemical being used in different ways in different parts of the body. That's uh, That'll be kind of a recurring thing when you get into biology 202 as well. All right, neurotransmitters, um, you know, as we talked about on the last video lecture, they're not supposed to permanently stay in a synapse. They're supposed to be degraded pretty quickly or diffuse away pretty quickly or in some cases they actually get taken back up into the axon terminals. That's called reuptake. And um, In the case of acetylcholine, um, in the synapses, in those gaps like we learned about when we covered the muscular system, you have this enzyme acetylcholine esterase degrades acetylcholine so that it doesn't keep stimulating the um, the muscle fiber or the other neuron that's over on the other side of the synapse or postsynaptic neuron. Okay, and then there are several um, neurotransmitters that are in a group called biogenic amines. And um, amines are chemicals that have on some part of their chemical structure, they have a nitrogen atom that is surrounded by hydrogen atoms. Well, actually, usually it's just two of them, sometimes three, usually just two. Those are called amines, so they'll have other atoms as part of their chemical structures as well, but they'll have a nitrogen and a couple of hydrogen atoms as well. Those are called amines, and um, 
biogenic amine, some of several neurotransmitters fall into this group. So a term that you will hear more of when you get into biology, 202 is catecholamines. So the CH there is pronounced like a K. That's not um, uncommon in, uh, in, the, in science. And some of these you've probably heard of before. Dopamine, you may have heard of dopamine before. Norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, if you haven't, now you've probably heard of epinephrine before, like if somebody has an EpiPen because they uh, need that to suppress allergic reactions um, or asthma attacks, which are also a type of allergic reaction as well. Um, these also go by the name noradrenaline and adrenaline. So if you haven't heard of epinephrine, you've certainly heard of adrenaline and having an adrenaline rush. So those are types of neurotransmitters as well. And then a couple of others, serotonin and histamine can function as neurotransmitters. Um, histamine has other roles in the body as well in triggering inflammation. And they fall into a group called the endolamines. So these are all somewhat chemically related to each other. These neurotransmitters are uh, secreted pretty widely in the brain and they do various things but um, one of the things that they're or some of the things that they're involved in are controlling your emotions and and um, regulating your biological clock is another thing your sleep cycles sleep wake cycles things like that all right then there are some so we've learned before that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins but you know living things are pretty good uh, at um, um, multitasking with certain types of chemicals and they do and our, our bodies do this with uh, some types of amino acids so these four neurotransmitters you see here all fall into the amino acid group glutamate aspartate glycine uh, uh, glutamate is a fairly commonly used neurotransmitter in the central nervous system and this one GABA which stands for gamma amino butyric acid is um, also pretty commonly used in the central nervous system as well. They fall into the amino acid group. Uh, then there are some that are peptides, and a peptide is simply just a short chain of amino acids. So a protein is a chain of amino acids. When you hear the term peptide, that usually means it's a shorter chain, just a few amino acids linked together to make that larger molecule. And since these are functioning in the nervous system, they can also be called neuropeptides. And some examples of these, substance P is um, a neurotransmitter that's used in pain signaling. And you've probably heard of this one before, endorphins. And uh, these are also a type of opiate molecule. And endorphins help reduce pain perception. And so maybe you've heard before of something like the runner's high, like when you're exercising and maybe it's painful at first but then the pain starts going away and uh, so some of that is caught caused by endorphins kicking in you know the body is realizing well this is painful but this is probably something that has to be done for survival it's probably good for me so I'm going to reduce the pain sensations so that this uh, activity can continue all right, when you take Biology 202, you learn more about the digestive system. There is communication that goes on between your digestive organs and the nervous system as well. And there are a couple of peptides you'll learn about then called somatostatin and cholecystokinin that are involved in regulating your digestive uh, system activities as well. All right, then there are, um, there's a group of neurotransmitters called the purines. And um, purine, all right, so we learned about nucleotides before. So we learned about nucleotides before. Those are your building blocks of DNA and RNA. And uh, purines are your A and G nucleotides. So they're as a group called purines as well. And one of these that can function as a neurotransmitter, now talk about multitasking with the molecule ATP. So we've heard about that many times. That's your the universal fuel molecule for living things. But um, in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system, um, ATP is actually secreted from neurons in some cases and used as a neurotransmitter. 
Um, and probably a key thing with ATP is that it is something that can provoke pain sensation. Otherwise, it's got quite a, uh, a variety of uses here as well, like producing fast or slow responses. So that lets us know that its uses are pretty variable. Oops, come on, pen, go off. Okay, and then interestingly, some of the neurotransmitters that are released by our neurons are actually gases, nitric oxide, or NO, that's a nitrogen and an oxygen atom that are bonded together, is actually a gas that is secreted by certain types of neurons. It's dissolved in your body fluids, so it's not really um, floating, uh, functioning so much as a gas in the body, it's just a dissolved gas in your body fluids like um, oxygen gas or carbon dioxide gas as well. So this is produced on demand. That means that the cells that release this, the neurons that release this, don't store this. They make nitric oxide just before they're going to secrete it. Um, and interestingly, this one is actually involved or believed to be involved in learning and memory. So it's um, kind of an important neurotransmitter. And then here's another interesting one. There are some of the neurons in your brain actually use carbon monoxide. So that's a carbon atom bonded to a single oxygen atom instead of CO2, carbon dioxide, is bonded to two oxygen atoms. So carbon monoxide is actually involved in brain signaling. Now we're used to hearing about carbon monoxide as something that we should avoid, and that's because you know, at high concentrations in the air that we're breathing in, um, it actually winds up interfering with oxygen uptake by our red blood cells, and that can kill you pretty quickly. But in little minute amounts um, used in signaling between neurons in the brain, it is actually beneficial. So that's kind of a interesting little tidbit of trivia there. Then there are some neurotransmitters that actually fall into a lipid group. And um, some of these are called endocannabinoids. And uh, maybe cannabinoid might remind you of cannabis, another name for marijuana. And um, the cannabinoid molecules in marijuana plants interfere with normal ne neurotransmitter function in the nervous system. And that's how uh, marijuana leads to its drug effects but we actually have some um, related molecules that we make in our bodies that are called endocannabinoids. And these are hydrophobic, they're lipid soluble, that means they're hydrophobic molecules that um, dissolve in lipids. And um, interestingly, they're actually made from lipids that are already in our cell membranes. They're taken out of the cell membrane and converted to these types of molecules and then uh, released for communication between neurons and so these are involved in learning and, uh, and memory interestingly enough. All right so that was just kind of a quick overview of some of the chemical classification of neurotransmitters. Check your the study guide for the unit 5 physiology as far as what I would like you to learn about neurotransmitters. On the next video lecture I'm actually going to um, talk a little bit more about neurotransmitter functions and I'll be linking neurotransmitters back to what we had on the previous lecture about excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Um, but check the study guide, and I'm not going to say anything specific here because I might change the assignments from semester to semester, um, but check your uh, study guide to see what I want you to do with neurotransmitters. And also, please be sure to check out the mouse party. I'll have that linked on Blackboard as well because that's kind of a cool little interactive thing that the University of Utah Learn Genetics Center came up with and um, they show you how different types of recreational drugs work and how they impact neurotransmitters that's how most recreational drugs work and um, so it's kind of cool you get to do things like take lab mice and expose them to things like cocaine and marijuana smoke and then they zoom in and they show you which neurotransmitters are being affected by these drugs and how that works. Um, in some cases the neurotransmitters stay in the synapse longer and that's how those drugs exert their effects. In other cases um, 
they prevent secretion of a neurotransmitter and that's how it winds up interfering with the uh, effects as well. So be sure you check that out. Um, that's linked for you on Blackboard. Next video lecture will be a little bit more about neurotransmitter functions.